Dr. King's speech offers us, offers us a comprehensive critique of the problems we continue to face and an inspirational vision of transformation. We are one of many readings happening across our nation today, and let's now hear the words and experience the thinking of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as he points the way toward a radical revolution in values we urgently need. come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. I join with you in this meeting because I am in deepest agreement with the aims and the work of the organization which has brought us together, clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam. The recent statement of your executive committee are the sentiments of my own heart. And I found myself in full accord when I read its opening lines, a time comes when silence is betrayal. That time has come for us in relation to Vietnam. The truth of these words is beyond doubt, but the mission to which they call us is a most difficult one. Even when pressed by the demands of inner truth, men do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy especially in time of war. Nor does the human spirit move without great difficulty against all the apathy of conformist thought within one's own bosom and in the surrounding world. Moreover, when the issues at hand seem as perplexed as they often do in the case of this dreadful conflict, we are always on the verge of being mesmerized by uncertainty. But we must move on. Some of us who have already begun to break the silence of the night have found that the calling to speak is often a vocation of agony. But we must speak. We must speak with all the humility that is appropriate to our limited vision. But we must speak. And we must rejoice as well. For surely this is the first time in our nation's history that a significant number of its religious leaders have chosen to move beyond the prophesied of smooth patriotism to the high ground of a firm descent based upon the mandates of conscience and the reading of history. Perhaps a new spirit is rising among us. If it is, let us trace its movement well and pray that our own inner being may be sensitive to its guidance. For we are deeply in need of a new way beyond the darkness that seems so close around us. Over the past two years, as I have moved to break the betrayal of my own silences and to speak from the burnings of my own heart, as I have called for radical departures from the destruction of Vietnam, many persons have questioned me about the wisdom of my path. At the heart of their concerns, this query has often loomed large and loud. Why are you speaking about war, Dr. King? Why are you joining the voices of dissent? Peace and civil rights don't mix, they say. Aren't you hurting the cause of your people, they ask? And when I hear them, though I often understand the source of their concern, I am nevertheless greatly saddened. For such questions mean that the inquirers have not really known me, my commitment, or my calling. Indeed, their questions suggest that they do not know the world in which they live. In the light of such tragic misunderstandings, I deem it of signal importance to try to state clearly, and I trust concisely, why I believe the path from Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, the church in Montgomery, Alabama, where I began my pastorate, leads clearly to this sanctuary tonight. I come to this platform tonight to make a passionate plea to my beloved nation. This speech is not addressed to Hanoi or to the National Liberation Front. It is not addressed to China or to Russia. Nor is it an attempt to overlook the ambiguity of the total situation 
and the need for a collective solution to the tragedy of Vietnam. Nor is it an attempt to make North Vietnam or the National Liberation Front paragons of virtue, nor to overlook the role they play in a successful re resolution of the problem. While they may both have justifiable reason to be suspicious of the good faith of the United States, life and history give eloquent testimony to the fact that conflicts are never resolved without trustful give and take on both sides. Tonight, however, I wish not to speak with Hanoi and the NLF, but rather to my fellow Americans who, with me, bear the greatest responsibility in ending a conflict that has exacted a heavy price on both continents. In 1957, 
when a group of us formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, we chose as our motto to save the soul of America. We were convinced that we could not limit our vision to certain rights for black people, but instead affirmed the conviction that America would never be free or saved from itself unless the descendants of its slaves were loosed completely from the shackles they still wear. In a way, we were agreeing with Langston Hughes, the black bar in Harlem, who had written earlier, oh yes, I say it's plain, America was never America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Now it should be incandescently clear that no one who has any concern for the integrity and life of America today can ignore the present war. If America's soul becomes totally poisoned, part of the autopsy must read Vietnam. It can never be saved so long as it destroys the deepest hopes of men the world over. So it is that those of us who are yet determined that America will be are led down the path of protest and dissent, working for the health of our land. As if the weight of such a commitment to the life and health of America were not enough, Another burden of responsibility was placed upon me in 1964. And I cannot forget that the Nobel Prize for Peace was also a commission. A commission to work harder than I ever worked before for the Brotherhood of Man. This is a calling that takes me beyond national allegiances. But even if it were not present, I would yet have to live in the meaning of my commitment to the ministry of Jesus Christ. To me, the relationship of this ministry to the making of peace is so obvious that I sometimes marvel at those who ask me why I am speaking against the war. Could it be that they do not know that the good news was meant for all men, for communists and capitalists, for their children and ours, for black and white, for revolutionary and conservative? Have they forgotten? that my ministry is in obedience to the one who loved his enemies so fully that he died for them? What then can I say to the Viet Cong, or to Castro, or to Mao, as a faithful minister of this one? Can I threaten them with death, or must I not share with them my life? Finally, as I try to delineate for you and for myself the road that leads from my own to this place, I would have offered all that was most valid if I simply said that I must be true to my conviction, that I share with all men the calling to be a son of the living God. Beyond the calling of race or nation or creed is this vocation of sonship and brotherhood. And because I believe that the Father is deeply concerned, especially for his suffering, and helpless, and outcast children, I come tonight to speak for them. This I believe to be the privilege and the burden of all of us who deem ourselves bound by allegiances and loyalties which are broader and deeper than nationalism, and which go beyond our nation's self-defined goals and positions. We are called to speak for the weak, for the voiceless, for victims of our nation and for those it calls to aid. For no document from human hands can make these humans any less our brothers. Americans as strange liberators. The Vietnamese 
the, the Vietnamese people proclaimed their own independence in 1945 after combined French and Japanese occupation before the Communist Revolution in China. They were led by Ho Chi Minh. Even though they quoted the American Declaration of Independence in their own document of freedom, they refused to recognize them. Instead, they decided to support France in its reconquest of the former colony. Our government felt that the Vietnamese people were not ready for their independence, and we again fell victim to the deadly Western arrogance that has poisoned the international atmosphere for so long. With that tragic decision, we rejected a revolutionary government seeking self-determination and a government that had been established not by China, for whom the Vietnamese have no great love, but by clearly indigenous forces that included some communists. For the peasants, this new government meant real land reform, one of the most important needs in their lives. For nine years following 1945, we denied the people of Vietnam the rights of independence. For nine years, we vigorously supported the French in their abortive efforts to recolonize Vietnam. Before the end of the war, we were meeting 80% of the French war costs. Even before the French were defeated at Dien Bien Phu, they began to despair of the reckless action, but we did not. We encouraged them with our huge financial and military supplies to continue the war, even after they had lost the will. Soon, we would be paying almost the full cost of this tragic attempt at free colonization. After the French were defeated, it looked as if independence and land reform would come again through the Geneva Agreement. But instead, there came the United States, determined that Ho should not unify the temporarily divided nation. And the peasants watched again as we supported one of the most vicious modern dictators our chosen man, DM. The peasants watched, and they cringed as DM ruthlessly routed all of his opposition, supported their intrinsic into landlords and re refused even to discuss reunification with the North. The peasants watched as all of this presided over by U.S. influence and then by increasing numbers of U.S. troops who came to help quell the insurgency that Diem's methods had aroused. When Diem was overthrown, they may have been happy again, but no real change, especially in the, um, in the form of their new and violent military leader. There was no land and no peace. The only change that came came from America as we increased our troop commitments in support of governments which were singularly corrupt, inept, and without popular support. All the while, the people watched. They read our leaflets and received our encouragement that and our regular promises that peace and uh, democracy would come. 
land reform. Either. Now, they languished uh, under just, our... Uh, I'm just recording it. I can't, I can't figure out ...own things. brutality. I tried to um, refer and over to... Now, the they consider us... Change the Not their fellow Vietnamese. Uh, to so That's a real enemy. Have it just be, you know, I thought perhaps simple, but uh, they move have sadly, set up, yeah, exactly apathetically. As we heard them into off their land, to to their fathers, and into concentration, concentration camps, so, I'm doing something. where minimal social needs are it's rarely met. Sorry. They know that they must move or be destroyed by one of our bombs. Along with this card, I so they go. This. I get it to Primarily it. women, yeah. children, yeah. and the aged. They watch. Change the length. And we poison their water. The 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 As we kill a million acres of their crop. They must weep as the bulldozers run through their areas, preparing to destroy their precious trees. They wander into the hospital with at least 20 casualties from American firepower for one Vietnam inflicted injury. So far, we have killed a million of if them. I could just do something pretty much this way. Children. They wander into the town, and they see thousands of children, homeless, without clothes, running in packs in the streets like animals. They see the children. Disgraced by our soldiers as they beg for food. They see the children selling their sisters to our soldiers, soliciting for their mother. So, how could someone give me technical data about the video tracks, streaming, or recording? What do peasants think when we ally ourselves with the landlords and as we refuse to put any action into our many words concerning land reform? What do they think as we test our latest weapons, just as the Germans tested out new medicine and new tortures in the concentration camps of Europe? Where are the roots of independent Vietnam we claim to be building? Is it among these voiceless ones? We have destroyed their two most cherished institutions, the family and the village. We have destroyed their land and their crops. We have cooperated in the crushing of the nation's only non-communist revolutionary political force, the unified Buddhist church. We have supported the enemies of the peasants of Saigon. We have corrupted their women and children and killed their men. What liberators. Now there is le little left to build on but bitterness. Soon, the only solid physical foundations remaining will be found at our military bases and in the concrete of the concentration camps we call fortified hamlets. The peasants may well wonder if we plan to build our new Vietnam on such grounds as these. Could we blame them for such thoughts? We must speak for them and raise the questions they cannot raise. These two are our brothers. Perhaps the more difficult but no less necessary task is to speak for those who have been designated as our enemies. What of the National Liberation Front? That strangely anonymous group we call VC or communists. What must they think of us in America when they realize that we've, we permitted the repression and cruelty of Diem 
which helped to bring them into being as a resistance group in the South. What do they think of our condoning the violence which led to their own taking up of arms? How can they believe in our integrity when now we speak of aggression from the North as if there were nothing more essential to the war? How can they trust us when now we charge them with violence after the murderous reign of Diem and charge them with violence while we pour every new weapon of death into their land? Surely we must understand their feelings, even if we do not condone their actions. Surely we must see that the men we supported pressed them to their violence. Surely we must see that our own computerized plans of destruction simply dwarf their greatest acts. How do they judge us when our officials know that their membership is less than 25% communist, and yet we insist on giving them the blanket name? What must they be thinking when they know that we are aware of their control of major sections of Vietnam, and yet we appear ready to allow national elections in which this highly organized political parallel government will have no part? They ask how we can speak of free elections when the Saigon press is censored and controlled by the military junta. And they are surely right to wonder what kind of new government will we plan to help form without them, the only party in real touch with the peasants. They question our political goals and they deny the reality of a peace settlement from which they will be excluded. Their questions are frighteningly relevant. Is our nation planning to build on political myth again and then shore it up with the power of new violence? Here is the true meaning and value of compassion and nonviolence when it helps us to see the enemy's point of view, to hear his questions, to know his assessment of ourselves. For from his view, we may indeed see the basic weaknesses of our own conditions. And if we are mature, we may learn and grow and profit from the wisdom of the brothers who are called the opposition. So too with Hanoi. In the north, where our bombs now pummel the land and our minds endanger the waterways, we are met by a deep but understanding mistrust. To speak for them is to explain this lack of confidence in Western words, and especially their distrust of American intentions now. In Hanoi are the men who led the nation to independence against the Japanese and the French the men who sought membership in the French Commonwealth and were betrayed by the weakness of Paris and the willfulness of the colonial armies. It was they who led a second struggle against French domination at tremendous cost and then were persuaded to give up the land they controlled between the 13th and 17th parallel as a temporary measure at Geneva. After 1954, they watched us conspire with Diem to prevent elections which would have truly brought Ho Chi Minh to power over a united Vietnam. And they realized they had been betrayed again. When we ask why they do not leap to negotiate, these things must be remembered. Also, it must be clear that the leaders of Hanoi considered the presence of American troops in support of the DM regime to have been the initial military breach of the Geneva Agreement concerning foreign troops. And they remind us that they did not begin to send in any large number of supplies or men until American forces had moved into the tens of thousands. Hanoi remembers our leaders refused to tell us the truth about the earlier North Vietnamese overtures for peace. How the president claimed that none existed when they had clearly been made. Ho Chi Minh has watched as America has spoken of peace 
and built up his forces. And now he surely heard of the increasing international rumors of American plans for an invasion of the North. He knows the bombings and shellings and minings we are doing are part of traditional pre-invasion strategy. Perhaps only his sense of humor and of irony can save him when he hears the most powerful nation of the world speaking of aggression as it drops thousands of bombs on a poor, weak nation more than 8,000 miles away from its shores.
The world now demands the maturity of America that we may not be able to achieve. It demands that we admit that we have been wrong from the beginning of our adventure in Vietnam. That we have been detrimental to the life of the Vietnamese people. The situation is one in which we must be ready to turn sharply from our present ways. In order to atone for our sins and errors in Vietnam, we should take the initiative in bringing a halt to this tragic war. I would like to suggest five concrete things that our government should do immediately to begin the long and difficult process of extricating ourselves from this nightmarish conflict. One, end all bombing in North and South Vietnam. Two, declare a unilateral ceasefire in the hope that such action will create the atmosphere for negotiation. Three, take immediate steps to prevent other battlegrounds in Southeast Asia by curtailing our military buildup in Thailand and our interference in Laos. Re realistically, accept the fact that the National Liberation Front has substantial support in South Vietnam and must thereby play a role in any meaningful negotiations and in any future Vietnam government. Five, we set a date that will remove all foreign troops from Vietnam in accordance with the 1954 Geneva Agreement. Part of our ongoing commitment might well express itself in an offer to grant asylum to any Vietnamese who fears for his life under a new regime, which included the Liberation Front. Then we must make what reparations we can for the damages we have done. We must provide the medical aid that is badly needed, making it available in this country if necessary. Meanwhile, we in the churches and synagogues have a continuing task while we urge our government to disengage itself from this graceful commitment. We must continue to raise our voices if our nations persist in its perverse ways in Vietnam. We must be prepared to match actions with words by seeking out every creative means of protest possible. As we counsel young men concerning military service, we must clarify for them our nation's role in Vietnam and challenge them with the alternative of conscientious objection. I am pleased to say that this is the path now being chosen by more than 70 students of my own alma mater, Morehouse College, and I recommend it to all who find the American course in Vietnam a dishonorable and unjust one. <coughs> Moreover, I would encourage all ministers of draft age to give up their ministerial ex exemptions and seek status as conscientious objectors. These are the times for the real choices and not false ones. We are at the moment when our lives must be placed on the line if our nation is to survive its own folly. Every man of humane convictions must decide on the protest that best suits his convictions, but we must all protest. There is something sed seductively tempting about stopping there and sending us all off on what in some circles has become a popular crusade against the war in Vietnam. I say we must enter the struggle, but I wish to go on now to say something even more disturbing. The war in Vietnam is but a symptom of a far deeper malady with the American spirit. And if we ignore this sobering reality, we will find ourselves organizing, organizing clergy and laymen concerned committees for the next generation. They'll be concerned about Guatemala and Peru. They'll be concerned about Thailand and Cambodia. They'll be concerned about Mozambique and South Africa. We'll be marching for these and a dozen other names, and attending rallies without end unless there's a significant and profound change in American life and policy. Such talks take us beyond Vietnam, but not beyond our calling as sons of living God. In 1957, 
A sensitive American official overseas said that it seemed to him that our nation was on the wrong side of the world revolution. During the past two years, we have seen emerge a pattern of suppression which has now justified the presence of U.S. military advisors in Venezuela. This need to maintain social stability for our investments accounts for the counter-revolutionary actions of American forces in Guatemala. It tells us why American helicopters are being used against guerrillas in Colombia, and why Americans, Napalm, and Green Beret forces have already been active against rebels in Peru. It is with such activity in mind that the words of the late John F. Kennedy come back to haunt us. Five years ago, he said, those who make peaceful re revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Increasingly, by choice or by accident, this is the role our nation has taken. The role of those who make peaceful revelation impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pleasures that come from the immense profits of overseas investment.
This kind of positive revolutionary values is our best defense against communism. War is not the answer. Communism will never be defeated by the use of atomic bombs or nuclear weapons. Let us not join those who shout war and through their misguided passions urge the United States to relinquish its participation in the United Nations. These are days which demand wise restraint and calm reasonableness. We must not call everyone a communist or an appeaser who advocates the seeding of red China in the United Nations and who recognizes that hate and hysteria are not the final answers to the problem of these turbulent days. We must not engage in a negative anti-communism, but rather in a positive thrust for democracy, realizing that our greatest defense against communism is to take offensive action in behalf of justice. We must, with positive action, seek to remove, to remove those conditions of poverty, insecurity, and injustice, which are the fertile soil in which the seed of communism grows and develops. These are revolutionary times. All over the globe, men are revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression, and out of the wombs of a frail world, new systems of justice and equality are being born. The shirtless and barefoot people of the land are rising up as never before. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. We in the West must support these revolutions. It is a sad fact that because of comfort, complacency, a morbid fear of communism, and our proneness to adjust to injustice. The Western nations that initiated so much of the revolutionary spirit of the, of the modern world have now become the arch anti-revolutionaries. And this has driven many to feel that only Marxism has the revolutionary spirit. Therefore, communism is a judgment against our failure to make democracy real and follow through on the revolutions we initiated. Our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and go out into a sometimes hostile world declaring eternal hostility to poverty, racism, and militarism. With this powerful commitment, we shall boldly challenge the status quo and unjust moors and thereby speed the day when every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. A genuine revolution of values means in the final analysis our loyalty must become ecumenical rather than sectional. Every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty to mankind as a whole in order to preserve the best in their individual societies. This call for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation is in reality a call for an all-embracing and unconditional love for all men. This oft-misunderstood and misinterpreted concept, so readily dismissed by the nations of the world as a weak and cowardly force, has now become an absolute necessity for the survival of man. When I speak of love, I am not speaking of some sentimental and weak response. I am speaking of that force which all of the great religions have seen 
as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. This Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality is beautifully summed up in the first epistle of St. John. Let us love one another, for love is God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth earth. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Let us hope that this spirit will become the order of the day. We can no longer afford to worship the God of hate or bow before the altar of retaliation. The oceans of history are made turbulent by the ever-rising tides of the world. History is cluttered with the wreckage of the nations and individuals that pursued this self-defeating path of hate. As Arnold, as Arnold Toyden says, love is the ultimate force that makes for the saving choice of life and good against the damning choice of death and evil. Therefore, the first hope of our inventory must be the hope that love is going to have the last word. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now, in this unfolding conundrum of life, the history and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked and dejected, with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at the flood. It ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in the passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. There is an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or our neglect the moving through their ranks, and having written moves on. We still have a choice to make. Nonviolent coexistence, or, vi or violent co-annihilation. We must move past indecision to action. We must find new ways to speak for peace in Vietnam and justice throughout the developing world, a world that borders on our doors. If we do not act, we shall surely be dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time reserved for those who possess his power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. Now let us begin. Now let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. This is the calling of the sons of God, and our brothers wait eagerly for our response. Shall we say the odds are too great? Shall we tell them the struggle is too hard? Will our message be that the forces of American life mitigate against their arrival as full men, and we send our deepest regrets? Or will there be another message of longing, of hope, of solidarity with their yearnings, of commitment to their cause, whatever the cost? The choice is ours. And though we might prefer it otherwise, we must choose in this crucial moment. As that noble bard of yesterday, James Russell Lowell, eloquently stated, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth and falsehood for the good or evil side. Some great cause brought from the Messiah, offering each a wound of light, and the choice goes by forever twixt that darkness and that light. Though the cause of evil prosper, yet his truth alone is strong, though her portion be the scaffold, and upon the throne be the wrong. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown, standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. 
And if we will only make the right choice, we will be able to transform this pending cosmic energy into a greater solid piece. If we will make the right choice, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our world into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. If we will but make the right choice, we will be able to speed up the day all over America and all over the world when justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream.